those small retailers that are not using AI are in real trouble. And we really believe this is going to be the most transformational thing we have seen in retail really since the barcode, but certainly um, since the, the creation of the super center. Um, we had we lost two million um, retailers, small retailers with Walmart growing out their super center network. We had four super centers in 1990. We had over 2000 by the year 2000. In that process, two million small retailers went out of business. OK, so um, when you look at the scale and what the opportunities that sit between the big boys here, um, they're just tremendous opportunities there. So if you're a small retailer, it you definitely have to be using uh, AI tools because it is a tremendous force multiplier. Welcome to Wealthy on. I'm Eric Chemi. We've been talking so much recently about artificial intelligence. What will it mean for consumers, for companies, both big and small? What will it mean for investment opportunities and ideas? Is AI going to be a creative force of destruction, right? Or is it going to allow more opportunities for people to have ideas, start new businesses, be more competitive? Is it growth creating or is it actually shrinking because there will be less work for all of us to do? So those are some of the questions that I wanted to talk about. And today I'm really glad that we've got Greg Music here. He's the founder and president of IHL Group. He's also their expert on AI, the chief AI expert or something like that. We'll get into yeah. that with Greg in a second. He's also one of the founders of the Retail Orphan Initiative, a charitable foundation that seeks to help the 400 million orphaned and vulnerable children around the world. So we'll get into that as well, retail ROI. But in terms of your work as a retail industry analyst, you've been noted by RIS News as one of the top 10 influentials in retail. The, Na the National Retail Federation says Greg is on the list of people shaping retail's future. He's also a member of the top 100 retail influencers from Rethink Retail. And he's frequently quoted in Business Week, Information Week, The Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine, and so many other well-known outlets. So, Greg, you know, let's get right into it. AI, is that actually going to help these companies grow or is it going to help kill these companies? Yeah, and we'll share the data. Eric, it's a pleasure to be with you, first of all. Uh, we'll show the data. Lots of data coming up, guys. Um, uh, here, but uh, it's the only way retail grows uh, from here on out. Um, and you'll see uh, from what we've seen for the last several years, uh, I think Jamie Dimon uh, said, uh, he said that we've been on a sugar high and nothing's benefited more than retail of that sugar high. And the question is, how do you grow from here? And AI is critical for that. I hear two different arguments. And, and I know you've got some data, you're going to show us some of your mm -hmm. research. One argument is that AI will crush big companies because they've got too much bloat, too much infrastructure, and it'll be all these small companies. You know, maybe you and me would start a company with two people and a bunch of AI. We could take down the big companies. So that's one argument. I see you shaking your head. It's the exact opposite. And then I hear the exact opposite argument. So it sounds like I know which camp which camp you're in, and obviously it has impacts for. Do you want to invest in the S&P 500? Do you want to invest in the biggest companies in the world? Or do you want to start looking away from that and start looking at other ideas, right? It has those, those implications. So I know you've got a lot of data, a lot of charts you've brought with us today. So let's, let's walk through it. We'll put up the, the chart on the screen here that we see the good, the bad, and the ugly retail inventory distortion. But but I assume Greg, this is going to be a lot more than just about inventories, right? Yeah, we're going to start wide. We're going to go through the inventory issues, which have been the biggest, most pressing issues retailers are faced with. And then we'll get into the AI impacts, not only of that, but overall with what's happening with AI. So uh, with that, uh, if you're ready, let's jump right in. Let's do it. All right. Well, once again, everybody, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Here's my email and follow. There's a lot of statistics here. Happy to share the slides with you and go through that if you email me there. Um, so with that, let's start wide. Let's talk about what's going on with uh, the economy, retail economy worldwide. And, and basically, if I had to shorten it uh, very, very quickly, Western Europe has been in a retail recession for the last year, year and a half. Um, they got a big bump with the influx of refugees. However, that changed dramatically here in with the war and uh, with things there. So Germany and the UK have been down. Germany is actually in a recession. The UK looks to be in a recession there. 
uh, France. The only part of Western Europe that has grown has been those sectors that saw a big influx of U.S. travelers, uh, Spain and Italy for the summer. Um, that is uh, there. Poland is still doing well. Hungary has been in a, a free fall, mainly because of their own isolation there. Um, and now if we switch to Asia, China is starting to come back now um, at 7.6% growth. It's almost to where it has been traditionally for growth that has been healthy in retail, but it's taken them a long time to get there. It's taken about eight months, nine months since they stopped the COVID lockdowns to get there. Uh, Japan's uh, going strong. They're actually looking at doing uh, a stimulus package there that will further assist retail. Uh, Vietnam is the star, though, in that region where it's been up for literally 10 months, ranging from 7 to 13 uh, percent growth there. So that's where we're looking at uh, most of the retail around the world. So it's ups and downs, et cetera, there. Now, let's look at the U.S. specifically. Um, and this is where the, the bulk of what we're going to talk about economically is going to be. Now, I've got a level set. Where have we been? And quite honestly, we've been on that sugar high uh, there because the government gave out so much money, over $2.1 trillion to consumers. We added the entire retail economy of India as growth in 2021. And that's the annual economy of India for retail for 1.2 or 1.4 billion people. We added as growth in the United States in 2021. And in 2022, we added the UK. Now, keep that in mind, because we did that with 3 million fewer workers. So another way of looking at that is we've been adding about a Home Depot every month to the US retail economy in terms of extra uh, things happening there. So do you, do you uh, need an, extra, extra an extra Home Depot location or an extra Home Depot annual revenue, company? annual revenues? All the adding. Home Depots. Yeah, you mean the entire Home Depot company? Correct. Correct. Yeah. It slowed recently. It was as high as $190 billion a month more. Um, it slowed now. We're, we're looking here. We're looking at about $150 billion in October. So it's slowed as money starts to run out, but just a massive increase in retail since before the pandemic. Is all, all that going to get sucked up? We had a conversation recently with a banking expert and, and John Maxfield, and he said, whenever you get these massive liquidity events in the economy, it gets to get put somewhere. And yeah. banks, for example, they do dumb things with all that extra money because they they really they not equipped to handle so much influx right away. That's why we saw those bank failures almost a year ago, because there was too much money for them to handle. Do you see the sugar crash coming and what will that mean? Yeah, I think we've got a sugar crash coming um, and we're starting to see it already. Uh, but it's not as devastating as you might think uh, there because the labor market is still strong. And this gets to the heart of where that spend goes. And we'll go a little bit more into that um, okay. there. The, so, the main point that I want to make right now is what the government says in terms of the rosiness of the retail market is not really true uh, out there as we look forward in 2023 uh, going forward. Uh, there are haves and have nots in the retail economy, just like there are in the consumer economy for that. Not not true in which way, just the fact that it's it's more heterogeneous, like there's it's good in some places, but bad in others. Or what are the government? What is the government saying that is specifically not true? The government data, in my opinion, has been about three months behind uh, what's really happening in the retail market. When you say that mass merchants and warehouse clubs are up, but both Walmart and Target said their numbers were down. There's a different connection there on a, in a particular month. Now, I'm not talking about this latest month. It just seems that the government data is, is off this year. Um, one of the things that happened without getting into the weeds is we used to have 61% of the market was part of their survey. That's down into the low 40s now. Uh, that's part of the issue, but it seems to be delayed uh, in reality to what's really happening at the, at the store or at the retailer level. Um, and that, that is delayed. And the danger of that is the Fed has been making decisions based on that delayed data. The NRF and CNBC just came out with a new, more real-time view of retail that I'm really, really excited about um, that just was released this past month. So I'm really looking forward to their latest data 
of what's going on because it's more up to date, I believe, than what the government's data is. If you know it's delayed and, you know, you're not trading on inside information or the government must know it's delayed, right? Other people must know it's delayed. They, I, 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 I hope so. I, I hope the Fed's not making decisions on data that you know is delayed. I, I hope I hope so. Uh, man, I don't want to open up Pandora's box, but I've got <laughs> a little bit of, explana- of exploration here, even with AI and learned some things that I was shocked to learn um, that impacted the accuracy of the data this year from the government. Can you give us one example? Um, well, there's been... Uh, there's always been this view that, hey, there's partisanship in there, whether or not that is true or not. I don't want to get into the politics. However, uh, the government has publicly said that the one of their systems, the, the systems that provides ex, uh, exporting of data was hacked earlier in the year. And that because of that date, and I forget the name of it, it's Make It Something, I believe, is the name of that system, um, was was hacked. And that there's some concern about the inputs of the data that was coming out of there that that could be making it a little more uh, bullish than it really is in the marketplace. Okay. Okay. Well, that, we could go off on a real side tangent on this that, one for sure. That could be a real side tangent. So yeah, let's get back on track. So we've got the yeah the growing of an entire Home Depot's you know all the Home Depots in the country. We grew that much more every single month. So and we did it with three million fewer people working in retail. Which is crazy. So keep that crazy. keep that in the head okay. right now as you think about how do you grow from here? Okay. How do you move forward from here? So if we look at the numbers, this is what the government releases um, there in terms of September. This is what it releases in terms of October. Everything's rosy. Everything's great. Everything's growing uh, there in most of the segments here. Um, once you add the CPI into things, we're barely up for October uh, there. And we're up slightly for the year. The only reason we're up for the year right now, um, uh, through year to date, uh, overall, right now, this is prior to uh, the inflation being added, is because the convenience, the gas prices are so much lower than they were a year ago. Um, generally, we find that every p- penny sustained in gas prices takes two billion dollars out of consumers wallets if that penny is sustained for a year so when that scales back that gives an influx of funds that are going into other sectors of retail but when you add overall inflation to retail for the year we're down 1.2 percent uh for the year in retail so how's that play out with the with holiday sales and quite honestly it's been a yo-yo uh we had an early start with prime day that was uh, relatively strong. Uh, Target and others came out and said the first two weeks of November were really slow uh, out there. And and then we got some card data that I'll show you that demonstrates that. And then we had traditional uh, Black Friday and Cyber Week, which was off the charts in terms of e-commerce growth there. Uh, But the stores uh, stores number was about 2.1% down from a year ago in terms of store sales there. So it's all over the place. NRF projects we're going to be between four and 5% uh, growth rate. If you add inflation to that, we're at one to 2%. And quite honestly, that's fantastic when you consider where we've been and how much money that was flowing into things. People are still uh, spending. My concern personally is that we're seeing this massive growth in the buy now, pay later, as well as debt laden uh, purchasing. Uh, I think most people are sit- <clears throat> looking at the headlines and are using retail as therapy in a lot of ways. I don't know if that's good for the consumer. That may come back to us um, in terms of credit card defaults and things like that in the future. Um, but uh, for retail to be up after all this money now being gone uh, that, uh, that the government had handed out is, is, a, positive, is a positive number uh, there. So um, so to share you a little bit of, of data, this is the data that shows how fast things drop from the end of October to early November. So this was this was a chart from the beginning of November, and we saw a really steep drop in comparative spending on card data um, during that first week of November. However, we saw uh, a big boost start happening in terms of what happened with Black Friday and Cyber Week. Now, I want to show you a couple charts just to show you how much of a yo-yo this is in 
this is. Now, health and beauty has been driving a lot of growth uh, for the whole year. Uh, Ulta and Sephora and those guys have just been going bank gangbusters uh, for things there. But this is Black Friday online traffic alone. So you see, this is what's changed year to year. And the really strong category was health and beauty. The consumer electronics was down sharply in terms of traffic. However, when you add in average spend, all of a sudden you see a different story. Less people shop for consumer electronics, but when they did buy, they bought more. So the average order value changed and went up as a result of that online. And, and health and beauty gets more moderate, but it actually improved. So when you look at health and beauty, home goods, luxury, still growing, um, where we see a order value for sporting goods and toys and gifts and things like that, that has gotten much lower there. Now, the thing to keep in mind- Can, here, I, can I cut you yeah, off? Yeah, So you said, if I understand, fewer orders, but if you have an order, it's a bigger order. It's a bigger order. So it's people buying uh, for consumer electronics. They may not buy the TV, but they'll buy the phone. Okay. So the phone may be more expensive or they're in that cycle of, Hey, I need to replace the laptop because I bought the laptop during COVID and now I need to replace that now again. And I'm looking at a surface or a, a MacBook pro or something like that. So that's driving these costs. That's the cost per transaction up. And, and I see all this in my, Main question is, and maybe you'll get to it later, but my main question is, so are we in a recession or not? Or are we headed into a recession <laughs> or not? Because, because I hear such mixed commentary from people. That's the beauty, that's the beauty of it. Uh, it. It's almost like politics. Pick your flavor and you can make a case for it. It's all over the place. That's why I'm so excited about this NRF CNBC thing is I think we're finally going to have a far more accurate view of things. And just like we have the CPI from the government, there's a site called Truflation that brings right. like a Nielsen report, real-time view of inflation that I think is far more accurate of what's going on with inflation. Truflation.com, without the E, right? T-R-U-flation. Correct. Truflation.com. And then and then the, the new thing from CNBC uh, and NRF. That right. just was released. So we've only got the first month's worth of data. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, keep going here because I, I'm looking at yep. these ups and downs because when you say fewer people are ordering, but when they order, they order more, the fewer people, you might say, hey, that's that's negative. Other people yep. would look at it, but they order more. That's positive, right? But you get both. So make Right. Make right. Work. So this, this chart looks at online spending only. And, and okay. it's really fascinating to me that 47% of the growth is in experiences. It's live events. It's eating out at restaurants. Um, those are the things that are driving uh, the growth here. Um, the non-gift uh, or buying for yourself is another twenty-nine percent. So, so gifts for the holiday for the holidays, gifting is actually third in the rankings here of what's purchased online. There is a lot of buying that's happening personally, and it's happening at a rate of three to one of people buying for themselves uh, for the holidays and rewarding themselves there. So is that's that new a, though? Is that free? It's not new. It's not new. It, it, maybe it's new in terms of uh, realization of the spread of that, okay. that is happening right now. Um, but like I said, there's a lot of retail therapy that is happening right now. So, so with that, um, a shift to the consumer themselves. And we've got a consumer that is house rich and cash poor. Uh, that because of the interest rates, we've had a massive swing in the cost of homes and the amount of homes. This is not a, a big story for anybody uh, watching this uh, here, but it, it costs a lot more to buy a home right now. Um, the good news is in the U.S. market, as compared to some of the other markets, we have very, very low interest rates. Uh, there, that is not true in some of the other markets like Australia and Britain, where variable interest rates have, have been uh, much higher than norm in those environments. When you look at the data, we have home ownerships at the highest rate we've ever had in, in America, and most of those mortgages are much lower uh, there, or 40% own their home free and clear. Part of the migration that happened due to COVID, you took people that uh, basically were able to own their homes 
by moving to another state as they moved out of, of some of the more restrictive states like New York and California to Texas, Tennessee, Florida, et cetera. And uh, that put the consumer in much more uh, better position there. There are big differences by demographics and locations, though, um, there that you have to factor in. And this inflation that we're seeing is particularly harsh to those that are on fixed income. So um, racing through that data, the excess money that the government handed out is essentially gone. That money is gone. This chart breaks it out by income uh, there. So the only money that was left there after June of this year was those who had on the top 20% of incomes that are driving things. And part of the concern for me from the retail side is a lot of this has been driven by credit cards. We've seen the highest uh, credit card debt in, in the U.S. We're now over a trillion dollars there in the third quarter. And those interest rates have skyrocketed for that. Um, I think what you saw is we, we saw a lot of people get their student de uh, student loans taken away and they went spending out there as a result of that on some retail spending. So how long that lasts, I don't know. Um, but the consumer at the low end is being squeezed and the middle and high end continues to spend, but a lot of that is being leveraged uh, spend right now. So that's that's the challenge for retail is, is how long can that last? And uh, I think we can have that soft landing, so to speak, in retail as long as the employment situation stays strong. So I'm hearing you say credit card debt is up. The interest rate on that debt is up. So now they got to pay a lot more. Yeah. If you try to get a new house, your mortgage is way higher. So all of a sudden money that you could use for retail to buy stuff that's getting soaked up. And like you said, all the COVID stimulus money, that's all gone. That's so gone. you're back to where you were with higher interest rates and more debt. That doesn't Correct. sound like a great place to be. It's not a great place to be. It's 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 a very, very tough place to be. And um, getting back to your AI question, which I'm going to get into in a, in a second, um, that squeezes the smallest guys first. The big guys can always work through this, through mergers, acquisitions, whatever. They can work through a lot of the stuff so as long as they were not leveraged with a lot of debt uh, there. But the smaller retailers, the smaller outlets, those are the ones that are going to see uh, things there. I, I will tell you, there's another piece of the of the macroeconomic perspective that is coming into play here as well when it comes to the restaurant side. And, it, and that is the retirees and the aging uh, retirees there. Um, they're eating out a lot more than previous generations do. And primarily because the cost of food at the supermarket, if you're only making food for one or two people, it is actually cheaper in a lot of cases for those folks to go eat out than it is to just buy those products and cook for themselves at the local at, at home. And as we see more and more baby boomers retire, that is now driving more restaurant spend um there which can will continue to buoy uh what's happening in our retail and restaurant numbers okay let's see what else what else we got on our on our great chart of data is there, is there more to share what do we got here that's it for the eco economy stuff now okay. i'm getting into the technology the ai and the retail problem specifically operational so let's let's okay. move on from that precursor that we've got here and let's talk about tech priorities what are retailers investing in and i want to focus on a couple areas here. Now, personalizing the customer experience has always been number one there, but you'll notice some of the other things, the CRM, empowering store associates. Walmart now has their Ask Sam AI tool that's available to 500,000 associates around the world in all the different languages now. Um, those are the big ones. But when we look at inventory, inventory is a big issue for retailers. We had, uh, if I had to use a metaphor, we had retail was humming prior to the pandemic and maybe a low-end NASCAR type of operation with just-in-time inventory and everything. The problem is, is that COVID threw a wrench into that, and we had a bomb on turn two. And, and so the big retailers started to reroute what they were doing and said, no problem, we're going to shut down. Uh, we're going to go past the concession stand there and go around and get back on the track. We'll be fine. And then, and then we had other disruptions that happened. Uh, in particular, we had the war in Ukraine. Um, that created a massive problem as well. And so you've had these continual bumps. And I believe we're about seven years into uh, uh, 
a disruption in inventory that is is causing retailers to really struggle through how do I get my inventories correct for things there. So there's a lot of input right now in terms of of prioritizing inventory visibility and optimizing the customer journeys because the average retailer loses five to 15 points of margin on a buy online pickup and store uh, situation today because they haven't optimized those uh, processes. And so that's where a big part of the investment is. To mention that they lose how much margin on pickup? Between five and 15 points of margin on the deal compared to what they make by just a regular in-store shopper because they're they, paying for they still make money. They just make less money. It depends on the segment, the okay. typical supermarket chain, um, depending on the item, a buy online, pick up and store free, uh, free service actually loses them money. Um, because the margins are so, so low when it's over. Right. So like Kroger, for instance, Kroger, Kroger released their earnings. Their net in earnings, I believe, were 1.9% um, uh, net income at the end of the day. And as a result of that, when you're looking at something where now you're paying an associate to run around the store to find things and you're not charging for that, that labor cost is just eating up the margin there for those individual items. Right. Okay. There. So it has okay. to be a certain level of product before or of order before you can actually make the money there. And that's one of the reasons why we've seen the big flood of self-checkout uh, in there is because self-checkout traditionally, I haven't done this in a number of years, but we found that self-checkout could be profitable on a $9 transaction where you were looking about 18 to $19 an hour uh, or $19 transaction for a staff line. And so that's the economics for the self-checkout uh, piece of it. So the leaders, the leaders are people who grew their sales 10% or more in 2023. So we looked at what are they doing differently because they're going to be leading this charge here. And you'll notice when it comes to the inventory and the optimizing the customer journeys, they are investing considerably more in those particular areas, as well as now we start to see the AI thing come in and that's cleaning and training and storing their AI data. Uh, they're spending considerably more there. They're spending less on the inventory visibility. And the reason for that is because they spend a lot more. And it, since they spend a lot more, they've already done the hard work on inventory uh, visibility. So we start seeing AI creep into this for the leaders associated with that. Now, when we look at emerging technologies, you start seeing some other things here. You start seeing the single data lake start to cr creep in uh, here overall for everybody. But you've got things like RFID communications out to the parking lot to make things faster for those uh, buy online, pick up at store journeys here using 5G, et cetera. What, what about the leaders? And this is where we really start to see the separation start to happen. The single data lake, getting to a single data source for AI purposes, number one by far, and the leaders are spending tremendously more in this area in particular. So look at IT. This is my Usain Bolt uh, chart here. And what this is, is what the IT spending growth is uh, by the size. So our leaders are 10% uh, sales growth or higher average is zero to 10%. Our below average is zero or negative there. And we can see that in enterprise IT spend, the leaders, are, their growth is close to four times that of the others. And it's it's like Usain Bolt, okay? So if I was racing Usain Bolt, he would not only be further ahead on the first step, but every other step he would continue to, uh, to get further ahead. And that is what's happening with retail. The rich are getting richer, and those that are struggling, that are leveraged, that can't invest, are getting beat up. And uh, as a result of that, our largest retailers, I, I believe, are going to benefit uh, from some of these tools that we're got coming forward. Any questions there, Eric? So, so many questions. I like the Usain Bolt <laughs> analogy. He gets out to a faster start and then continues to get out further and further away from you. Every step, he's getting away from you. So I see your point, the bigger companies... Yeah. that was my thought when i was talking to somebody a couple of weeks ago they said ai and it it's going to allow smaller companies to take over but i'm thinking you need a lot of people still behind it you need a lot of investment you need a lot of time and effort and his point was well but big companies have old 
processes. They have old infrastructure. You can't tweak it for AI. But I'm still thinking I'd rather have a thousand people working on AI than three people working on AI. That's, yep. that's my guess. Yeah, I'll share my metaphor and all that as soon as we get to that AI stuff. So I want to get into this inventory thing real quick uh, just to get through. So we called it the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I'm going to race through this data here to get to the AI data so we can have more discussion. But inventory distortion, which is the difference between what the consumer wants to buy and what retailers have on, on stock to buy. Um, the idea for our study that we started in 2008 actually came from a Wharton um, case study that we read that basically said that the retailer thought they were in stock 92% of the time, but the consumer actually said, no, you're only in stock 75% of the time when they did exit interviews because the consumer considered you out of stock if there weren't enough people working there, if it was locked up and you couldn't get to it. Uh, if the person there couldn't find it, you found people that would work there, but you couldn't find that, or the pricing was wrong. The The consumer was losing about one, one in four items that they were coming in the store to buy because of these issues. And so we started looking at how big is this issue and how does it change? So it's about a $1.8 trillion overall problem in retail, which is bigger than the entire retail GDP of uh, Mexico on South in the Americas, um, in the Latin and South America uh, market. It's, it's bigger than that entire market overall. Most of that is out of stocks. We went through overstocks through that quick period at the early part of the, of the Ukraine war. Um, there, but that has been mostly worked out and we're still dealing with a lot of out of stocks there. The biggest issue is in Asia overall, because we've had a rapid increase in retail without a lot of sophistication um, in some of those cases or an infrastructure that can support that kind of growth um, uh, that was coming into play. So we still have a lot of issues there. North America, it's relatively modest. Uh, they're at $244 billion. Um, so the North America and EMEA are, are pretty efficient comparatively to the rest of the world when it comes to that. Um, this is the breakout of that, uh, where that money is spent. You can see Shelf Empty is by far the largest piece of that at $700 billion in lost cause, lost cost uh, because of those, those issues there. Now, when you ask retailers so we survey retailers and we survey consumers when we ask retailers who's to blame when this happened the vast majority of it remains supplier issues we have issues where uh, one piece can't finish the product uh, i would talk to uh, a guy whose family makes pot pies and they couldn't ship 12 inch pot pies to restaurants because they couldn't get the aluminum pans they had every other ingredient, but they couldn't get the aluminum pan. So the supplier issues remain a major issue and a major problem that we're facing uh, with things. Now, the cost issue is no longer at the point of production. The cost issues are more in the transportation and the warehousing of products where the cost growth is. Uh, but supplier issues remain the big thing. Personnel issues. I don't have enough people working or they're not properly trained. Um, there is another big issue that's there. And then we see uh, rising theft, and we'll talk about that in nature. So if we fix the problem, it would basically be about 5.7% increase in same store sales in North America um, and higher in regions around the world. So what's the good? What, what's happening good and what's, what's happening and, and move things forward? Well, we made some major improvements in inventory distortion, we dropped the uh, the cost of that $172 billion, or roughly the, the Home Depot again for there. That improvement was on the overstocks. We greatly improved our inventory position and lowered, out, uh, lowered the overstock issue and having the right merchandise in stock versus having um, a bunch of patio furniture uh, when the war started, like we saw with Home Depot, Lowe's, and Target uh, during those initial stages of things. We made uh, major improvements around the world in terms of overstocks, and we made improvement every region in the world in terms of out of stocks um, in every region of the world in 2023, with the exception of North America. And that brings me to the bad. We saw a major drop in efficiency in out of stocks in North America for this year. And um, that actually the reason for that is the ugly, and that ugly is 
everything related to theft and what's happening. Um, organized retail crime by our estimation now is a hundred billion dollar problem in and of itself um, beyond just the average theft and the average uh, shrinkage that is happening in a retail store. Uh, our numbers for North America for shrinkage are considerably higher than those you may see from the NRF primarily because the NRF doesn't count restaurants, doesn't count convenience stores as part of retail. Um, and so there's a very limited uh, data set in terms of what's there now. So organized retail crime, we could go on and on about that. But uh, those of you watching may have encountered all of these things here. At the end of the day, a product that has a, uh, a 5%, 5% net mar uh, margin there, um, if they have 75% gross margin, I mean, they're literally betting that 15 of these things, I'm going to lose 14 sales and still be ahead um, by locking it up where people are going to walk away. I'm still better, more ahead than I was when I, uh, if I lose one from a theft. So Wait, say those numbers again. So if they've got, it's just, it's, just, it's mind, net. it's mind boggling. So a retailer that only makes 5% net income there, but they're, if they're, if their gross margin was 75%, on that item they're there they have to have 14 before they 14 and a half before they would lose by a lot so 14 customers would have to walk away before they would lose the margin that they would lose if they lost one through theft stealing one is the same loss as 15 people not buying not buying because of the so like give me an example number so if you have 75 percent gross margins and five percent net margin so what is the like typical let's say it's a ten dollar item so a ten dollar yeah. item so you're saying the net margin really means it's the nine fifty nine dollars fifty cents what were we give me an example of like how that oh happened. well you, you, it's all over the map yeah. i mean generally like in you that case to mark things up for four x what you pay for them um so it's it's a 20 if it's a 25 percent depends on how competitive the market is for that right. particular item when you get into high-end consumer goods, you don't have that benefit. It's, it's a much, much tighter in that environment. But generally, on average, the gross margin, I'm sorry, the, the, the SG&A is about 28 to 29% for things. So your, uh, your gross margins there have to be uh, in the 40, I'm sorry, it would have to be, if I had to do the math, you'd have to be 40% um, or higher there for your gross margins to have that five percent net margin as a result of that so it depends on it depends on the product i, I was just throwing that out as a but I, I, I liked your example i was just trying to think through just for people watching yeah. you know okay let's just say if you had five percent net and 75 gross so what would that be let's say on a ten dollar item does that right. mean the cost of goods is, is two dollars and fifty cents or the cost of goods is what are we it, 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 it depends on it depends on what it is it would be right. it would yeah it would be it wouldn't be that for toothpaste but it might be for the what is that eye drops or something on the other side yeah. of that of that um it might be for that because you have a higher multiple but you've got with the uh the toothpaste you have a much uh you know tighter supply chain and much more higher competitors as a result of that so it, it varies per for product there. So it's but they're all saying we would much rather not have it get stolen. We would much rather, we, we really don't want it to get stolen, but we're okay with people walking away because it's locked up. Yeah. Oh no, we're not, we're not good with either one of them. That's why we're closing stores. Um, right. You know, if you look at what Walgreens experienced in, um, in San Francisco, they had shared that their losses, they, they lost 10% of same store sales um, in that particular market, um, it was their theft when the average theft is 2% nationwide. Right. So they were seeing five times more economic losses there. So what's their response is you have to lock it up. And what's the response by the customer? They may walk away because it's such a frustrated and frictionful right. buying experience. And then, then you just close the store at that point. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So they were spending 40 control. times the armed security budget as well versus the others around the country. Okay. Um, it's, it's just a massive, it's a massive problem uh, that's in play there. So, but that's, that's what caused the inventory issue uh, with that. So, 
So all of that leads to this AI discussion. It really is retailers have to do more with less. If we grew India and the UK with 3 million fewer workers, how do you grow from here? And how you grow from here is now we have to look at AI. And this is where my metaphor comes in with things. And when you're comparing retailers, it's kind of like getting to LaGuardia from Midtown. Um, all right. Um, there are some major retailers like a Walmart, like an Amazon. These guys have been investing in cleaning their data, getting their data ready to take advantage of AI for a number of years. Target's another one. Um, where they've, they've done the hard work, they've cleaned the data. Those guys are through the tunnel, getting ready to go past the toll booth, and they're starting to see incredible benefits. The vast majority of retailers are stuck between 8th and 9th in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic on 42nd trying to get across town. And that is where we are now. And then all of a sudden, a year ago, we had uh, ChatGPT get announced and generative AI came onto the scene, and most people didn't start realizing it until we got till the uh, March timeframe. And that leads us to now generative AI, now having all the headlines, but it's really generative AI on top of the hard work and the clean data that is there that's driving the big value. And then we've got this elusive AGI uh, coming um, that will have an impact, but that's gonna be later on in the decade. And, and it really in our forecast is gonna be a small part of uh, through the end of the decade uh, for things here. So we did a product, um, we did a, uh, a forecast for the retail industry overall, and I thought we'd share how we went about it for you folks. Um, without having an exhaustive use uh, list of use cases, we, we went through and we said, you know, what's the best way of looking about what the impact of AI can have on this industry? Realizing that a lot of retailers were already starting to get the traditional AI ML benefits in 2022. And so we said, well, the best way to look at it is just look at it from an income statement standpoint. So we looked at sales growth opportunities for AI. Then we looked at gross margin improvements. And then we looked at SG&A improvements. And then we looked at each of those categories of traditional AI ML and machine learning, um, the uh, generative AI, and then the uh, artificial general intelligence. And we started putting things into buckets as a result of that. And um, that was at our high level. And then we took it down. And once again, not having an exhaustive use uh, of use cases of how AI could be used yet, we used our IT spending model as a way of putting it into buckets to show where would these benefits, what would be the technologies that would help drive when they're AI enabled would help drive these benefits. And that's how we put this uh, put this together. So we, I believe we had uh, 10 or 11 segments, retail segments that we looked at, and then we looked at these categories and then we uh, went down through that. So we did a top down analysis first um, when we started to do it. And what we came out with was a massive number. Um, it was an unbelievable number at first, $9.2 trillion in impact through the end of the decade. Now, when you consider we're looking at about $5.5 trillion for North America or for the U.S., excuse me, um, U.S. retail economy today, this seems like a massive, massive number. But this is a worldwide number. And it's through combined through the end of the decade here. Now, this is benefit that only comes from now AI enabling on uh, things. We didn't really include economies of scale uh, benefits uh, to this as we went through. We just uh, other other than the AI improvements uh, associated with that because it just became a circular wheel as it went forward. But that's how we went about creating our forecast. And when you look at it here, you see. Uh, this is our growth rate, the wrong screen here, growth rate overall. Um, the traditional AI machine learning, the people that have done the hard work, the blocking and the tackling are going to see the greatest benefits going forward. But when you start adding the generative pieces on top of clean, accurate data, you get astounding results as we're going forward there. So that's how we went about it. Our view is it's almost going to be 50-50 by the end of the decade. Uh, there in terms of traditional AI versus uh, 
uh, generative AI as we go on forward. However, that benefit is going to be radically different. And I think this chart, this next chart, Eric, gets to the heart of small companies, large companies in terms of benefits, because AI greatly favors the single channel retailer. Um, and that's where a small company with just a few people could create a new business without all these locations and take significant market share by leveraging AI tools. And that can definitely be true. Um, but when it comes to AI to do AI right, you have to have a lot of data. That data has to be tagged. That data has to be told what it is um, there, and it has to be accurate. Um, otherwise, you get forecasts, just bad forecasts much faster. You get other things much faster. Um, and, and you get errors much faster. So you need a lot of data there. That data has to be accurate. It has to be relatively uniform as well. So UPC based businesses where every product has a unique barcode um, has a tremendous benefit over things like clothing where you have color and size added to uh, things there as well. So um, when you look at the per segment benefits, it's a pure play e-commerce, then it's your grocery and your hypermarkets that have tremendous advantages over other segments in deploying this because they've got cleaner data that is more ubiquitous and homogeneous data that they can leverage to take advantage of that. Uh, their loyalty plans and things like that, they have a lot more clean data on the consumer side as well, not just the inventory side. And so there are tremendous benefits as a result of that. And then at the heart of that, and this is where we firmly believe on our end, it's the rich get richer and it's the biggest retailers that benefit because to make the AI ML stuff work, you have to have lots of data to train the models and that data has to be accurate and tagged and you have to have enough data to where it gets accurate in that way. That's the irony of all of it, right? You need all these people yeah. to make sure that the data is accurate and you need to have all these transactions were fundamentally you need people to transact with you to get the data in the first place. Correct. Correct. And that is, um, that is the thing, reason why we say those small retailers that are not using AI are in real trouble. And we really believe this is going to be the most transformational thing we have seen in retail really since the barcode, but certainly um, since the, the creation of the super center um, we had, we lost 2 million um, retailers, small retailers with Walmart growing out their super center network. We had four super centers in 1990. We had over 2000 by the year 2000. In that process, 2 million small retailers went out of business. Okay. So um, when you look at the scale and what the opportunities that sit between the big boys here, um, they're just tremendous opportunities there. So if you're a small retailer, it, you definitely have to be using uh, AI tools because it is a tremendous force multiplier. And generative AI in particular is a huge force multiplier. What exactly is the AI helping these big retailers do? Is it just better pricing? Is it yeah. inventory me, management? What is it actually I, doing? Can I get through that? Let me go, let me go through that here yeah. um, because I'll show you. This is our line of business um, areas of, of things here. So um, we believe merchandising and supply chain. It's estimated that over 50% of the trucks on the road are 25% or less full right now. Um, that is a massive problem in terms of fuel, logistics, everything else, massive opportunity for AI to improve that. Scheduling of, of routes, scheduling of deliveries, uh, there are massive improvement opportunities there for that. Um, the other thing is, is you have mass customization. When you think of a Walmart or a Target today, they can't do personalization well. With AI, they can do personalized ads. And at the end of the day, the goal is to, to be con convince the consumer that I could see myself doing that. I could see myself buying that or driving that. Um, that's where AI comes in from the sales standpoint. But then there's also a lot of opportunities on the gross margin standpoint as well. Um, and that's where you get into supplier negotiations. Walmart has already saved 3% on store fixtures when an AI, a generative AI model has negotiated the terms um, because the AI never had a bad day. Their kid was never sick. They weren't cranky. They were always looking for a win-win solution. And it was actually rated higher by the humans on the other end who were negotiating against the AI. Um, 
that's those are some of the things. So demand better forecast, better optimization of the inventory, better store clustering as to what products go into which store as to how much the routing logistics, the quality control negotiations. Um, this is where you have clean data, accurate data has a huge benefit when you add that generative AI on top of it to make it better. So right now, those benefits are mostly in the traditional AI ML. Um, but they're growing uh, dramatically um, as we get later into the uh, years when that generative AI is added on to things going forward. Then, then generative AI, when it jumps to light speed when it comes to impact of SGNA. So where the benefits in sales as well as the um, gross margin improvements have a lot to do with the traditional AI and ML and having lots of data that's clean, tagged, and accurate. You can get tremendous benefits on the knowledge worker in the SGNA side, uh, tremendously using those tools, uh, ChatGPT and, and derivatives of that, particularly when you're limiting it to your particular data. And this is why the Microsoft 365 Copilot can be so powerful uh, as a tool. Um, automating uh, routine tasks there, CarMax. Uh, has shared that they were able to update all their cars across all their systems and basically do things in a matter of hours that were taking a month to do. Um, we saw in New Mexico, a new baby being born there. They said it would take a person a month to get them installed and li listed in all the systems and all the programs, and they had to be set up for that. Now they're doing it in less than 10 minutes using artificial intelligence. So these routine tasks that are the same over and over again major issues. Reduction of labor costs, better labor scheduling, better viewing of what's happening, forecasting and, and deploying your labor there. The personalized targeted marketing, as we talked about, um, you know, uh, your, your family's different than my family right now. My kids are graduating college right now. Eric, your, your house is full of little ones. All little over behind the you, yeah. Little you behind. Know? So the ad that you see mimics your family structure, the ad I see fit sees mine, it's going to be more college age and colors right. that match my color, you know, all those sort of things. The, the improved communication, this is where generative AI is going to shine the brightest. And it's just absolutely huge as well. We're going to see some of those operational issues in terms of uh, analytics. This is the prescriptive analytics is where we see a lot of AI in use today. Store performance is the biggest area but we see this massive growth of loss prevention. So at the end, to close this up, just want to talk about, you know, what, what is happening in terms of retailers when they use AI ML, what are, what are the actual results? And for the first time, we actually have survey results that now show this. So we looked at 11 different solution areas, everything from order management all the way down to HR and loss prevention activities here where AI and traditional AI and machine learning was used today. And then we looked at that by the performance of those companies here. And what we have found here is that those using AI and machine learning in those categories saw sales growth that is 2.3 times that of those that were not. Uh, so if the average was five, they're seeing 11 and percent sales growth. Uh, those people that are using AI and ML across all those those different tools. For profit growth, their profit growth is two and a half times. So that's uh, 5% versus 12 and a half percent for those that are looking at it. When they looked at 2024, what they expected to see there, um, massive increases, um, literally up to three times uh, the profit growth uh, for those that are already using AI and their solutions there. So it really is a force multiplier and an opportunity to grow. So I have my warning here, and it's not related to uh, job loss and all that sort of thing. But when it comes to doing AI, uh, using the sports metaphor from Reese Davis, uh, dumb loses more than smart wins. And that is definitely true when it comes to AI. You want to start where you have the cleanest data the most accurate data, and that's where you want to deploy AI um, and where you see what's our greatest benefit. When those three match together, if you did those Venn diagrams together, where those overlap, that's where you start with AI to make a difference. So we took this data and then we started to analyze it down to the individual retailer basis. So we created an algorithm with nine points to that. It had things like AI maturity, I'm sorry, um, analytics maturity, data maturity, um, the segment itself because of the segment benefits, 
we looked at are they involved in the local um in the overall broader economy of retail sharing what they're doing getting input from others there and then we had things like scale in there as well as other things we have public as well as private data that we could leverage uh, for that and we put it on a hundred point scale where zero was not ready at all and a hundred percent says totally ready to take full advantage of things and our rankings came out like this amazon came out number one at a rating of 83.7 there walmart number two target number three and we've ranked uh north american public retailers here so we've got i believe 185 we excluded the oil companies and we excluded um, some of the cell phone uh, companies there because of the trying to figure out where their revenues were versus service revenues related to that. But out of the other 185 there, Amazon came out as number one. Um, the benefit there is they own the infrastructure as well as uh, as being very, very well prepared in the traditional AI and machine learning side of things. And Walmart for several years was actually hiring more data scientists than Google. And thus, they are very, very advanced in what they're doing from an AI standpoint as well. We then took that to look at, okay, we had this $9.2 trillion from a top down. What do, what's it look like if we go bottoms up? Now, looking what the opportunity is when we match it up to that data that we have on these individual retailers. And we saw $316 billion potential increased benefits. Okay, this is potential benefits for Amazon, another 264 billion for uh, benefits for, for Walmart here. And these benefits, extra, extra, extra revenue. benefits, extra right. benefits that are there if they optimize everything related to that and they don't use that to lower prices or you know drive people out of business or things like that, if they take it through there. Now they they may do a tweak of this to do other things and, and actually use that as competitive advantage to take out competitors. Imagine what this means from a market cap point of view. Right? Yes. If you can get that much extra revenue, now you stick a multiple on it, add that kind of market cap to these stocks. That's a massive growth opportunity in terms of if you were invested in these stocks for the next few years. Yeah, Eric, and this is where that 9.2 that we saw was so huge. When we started doing it from the bottoms up, the scary part about that is we think the 9.2 is low. Um, when we had to make these two models work, we could only make Walmart's margins go from, I believe, 24.2 to 25.6 for gross margins. Um, now, do I think it's going to be better than that? Yes. Um, I couldn't do it, though, and fit into my 9.2 that I did at the top. So, um, yeah, it could be even bigger than the numbers that we're showing here um, in terms of improving. And that's the scariest thing about it. And this is why we said this is really a big retailer thing versus a small retailer thing. Because if you think of this, um, a 1% increase for for um, Walmart right now is, what is that, 6.4 trillion? No, it's more than that. It's 6.4 yeah, it's, it's billion, right? Uh, they're $640 billion company. Right, right. Is, that right? is that my math right there? Okay. Yeah. Your average small retailer is a million a million dollars. Right. Right. Okay. Just their little incremental is so much bigger. And I didn't realize that yeah. they were hiring more data scientists than Google, right? That's a scare because yeah. you see Amazon, you think, oh, right, they're a tech company. But then you realize nobody they're competing against these other retailers. So they're really a retail company. Correct. But we think of them as a tech company based on who works there. So it makes sense that their direct competitors are probably hiring very similar people. Correct. Now, this is going to this is going to mind boggling here, too, because when you see these numbers at the top and then you think of a company like Macy's and see how these multipliers play out, we then took this down and we now have these AI readiness profiles on individual retailers. So we have for all those 185 uh, retailers, we now have this which looks at those specific retailers and what that forecast is per year and where those benefits will come per year. So we're projecting seven and a half billion dollars for Macy's um, there. I mean, we, we tend to think of Macy's in the same uh, bailiwick as a, a Walmart in terms of competitors. It's like, no, they're not even close because of the scale difference. And you, when you're talking about AI, you can't get away from the scale of, of the retailers of, of being the benefit because it is such a huge part of what happens with AI. 
um, is the amount of data that you have access to, the cleanliness of that data, and how much of it you control uh, versus your competitors uh, related to that. So um, this is page one of those profiles because the forecast, then we break it down by the line of business benefits of where those benefits would come, whether it's infrastructure, store systems, merchandising and supply chain, and then the individual technologies underneath those that drive, will drive these benefits, where they'll derive these benefits from. So um, those are some of the products we have. We've got AI forecast. Uh, so the overall forecast um, top level is free. You can get that on our website. Uh, that inventory distortion uh, stuff is free. Then we've got a variety of these tools that we offer that are available for sale. So, so much there. That was so it. much. The good, yeah. the bad, the ugly. We, we went through a lot there. A Thank lot. you for kind of walking us through the research. I'll, I'll take the chart down now, the, the table, but but that's good. So remind people. So actually, you've got, actually, I'll put it back up for a second. So people, yep. so it's ihlservices.com is the website. Correct. There's right. your email, greg at yep. ihlservices.com. So if people want to get some free research, they can. They can pay for some research too if they want to get a little more advanced and down you know, in the real uh, nitty gritty details there. But it does really open your eyes to investing in retail going forward because I do think that we often look at these macro factors on, well, what's the Fed going to do? And what are interest rates right. and gas prices and all of these things. And then we think, okay, well, if the economy is weak, these retailers are going to suffer, but it's possible that re these retailers will be fine over the next 10 years because they're going to eat up all the market share of, you know, like you said, the Walmart example, you had 2000 super centers, 2 million other retailers disappear as a result. Right. So you might have a generally negative environment, but these giant companies might still get even more giant because it'll be the smaller millions of retailers that disappear. Right, right. And it gets to the end of the day. So you had mentioned the uh, smaller, you you and a couple of people. Okay, so yeah, you're going to build a, a $10 million retailer, a $100 million retailer. That's a blip when you're comparing yourself to Amazon or right. Walmart or somebody else that are using these tools. Yeah. What, what are just a couple other myths before we go in terms of when people think about, you know, they look at retail to figure out the economy or vice versa. What are some other myths that you find that people don't understand in terms of how the industry works? So you can't just say like, oh, I think macro is weak, so I'm going to short retail. Yeah, the uh, the biggest thing we see, the biggest myth is that, oh, retail, retail must be like banks. You have branches, you have stores. They should just be that easy. And our product works here. We can move it over to here and make a difference. Um, I think the thing that surprises people is how complex retail is. Um, the reason that Walmart, Target, Home Depot, and Lowe's got in trouble with overstocks is because they were actually better positioned than anybody to take advantage of things as long as Russia didn't invade Ukraine. They, they leased their own ships. They weren't in the bottleneck out in Long Beach in LA, they had smaller ships. And as a result of that, they were incredible position to fully take advantage of things. But then we've got this macro event that just changed everything and they got crucified because they had all this inventory that was there. We've got to get to a, and that's the challenge with AI. AI does not um, do major disruptive events well. Right, it doesn't it, predict the war is gonna start tomorrow. Consistent. Yeah, what's consistent. Now it can recover faster. Computer aided ordering saw that, for instance, you know, you need to order a hundred times more toilet paper at the beginning of the pandemic. The computer saw it, placed the order, and human beings said, Oh, that must be a mistake. And they and they did that. And they canceled those orders in some cases. So that's the challenge with this AI type stuff, is you need the circumstances to be uh pretty well perfect in those environments to get the full benefit. Where can AI go wrong though in these circumstances? Where AI generally goes wrong is where your inputs are incorrect or the data is not clearly defined. Like I tell everybody, um, if you're using chat GPT or any of these tools, the first, th the first step is t you need to tell it what it is because it's got this massive data set of the internet. And then you say, no, you're an expert retail analyst. Okay. 
Right, right. Now I know my subset of data. Then you tell it, you ask it exactly what you want to know. And then you tell it how exactly you want that output. And you'll be astounded by the results. Where the mistakes made is at that front part where you don't have clean data. It's not accurate data. It's not your data. And that's why those guys, like I said, the people that did that hard work, that, that, that training of the data, cleaning the data, tagging the data, are so much further ahead in that metaphor getting across New York City because anything they do with AI on top of that is far more accurate as a result. Excellent. Very cool, Greg. Just leave us real quickly, you know, just tell us a little bit about retail ROI. What are you doing with the Retail Orphan Initiative? Yeah, I guess you can see the pictures in the back there. Um, so we started an organization in uh, really the day Lehman Brothers went under. It was at Oracle Open World, a bunch of people in the retail industry to help orphans and vulnerable kids. Um, and we wanted to use our skill sets to make a difference. We have an event called Super Saturday, and I hesitate. I should have put the chart in here. Um, uh, you can find more information at retailroi.org. Um, this is an analyst day. It's a day like this where we're going to talk a lot about AI. It's in Manhattan on the 13th of January. We call it Super Saturday. And um, the proceeds from that event, uh, from sponsorships, basically, have helped over 325,000 kids. Um, we do three things um, with Retail ROI. We use uh, who we are to, in our platforms to share the needs. Number two is we use those skill sets to make a difference. An example is um, we had a school of 650 kids that needed food. Through networks and connections, we were able to provide two train cars worth of corn delivered to that school for about $7,500 um, and fed those kids for a year as a result of that because of who we knew and how those networks there. And then we come alongside great charities where we can bring executive talent to double, triple, quadruple the work. So that's what Amazing. we do. Amazing. Yeah. So retailroi.org and Super Saturday, January 13th in Manhattan, if anyone is, is right. interested. This is great, Greg. Appreciate it. You My know, pleasure, Eric. If anyone's curious, again, ihlservices.com. And so people can find you there, obviously. And for those of you watching, you know, thank you again for watching. If you like this episode, you know, like it, share it, forward it, subscribe. All of those things really help get the content out there. And if you're watching this and you think maybe I need an expert, in finance to help me with my investments get on track so I don't have to spend an hour myself going through all of these charts in every single industry to try to do it yourself. We've got investment professionals that we endorse at wealthion.com. You can fill out the short form right there, very short form. And there's no commitment, there's no obligation. You can just have a conversation. If you like them, great. If you don't like them, that's also great. But we just provide this as a public service for more people who want to help get their family's finances on track. So you'll find that short form at wealthion.com. Thanks again for listening, for watching. We hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.